Hello, I'd like to give a third lecture for the first two weeks, or the first module one and two, of online population genetics. And this follows on the history of the modern synthesis that's in the second lecture. So as I said before, population genetics is a unique field in that it existed for about 50 years before there was real data. And part of that is that the field of genetics in general uh, really emerged out of evolutionary biology as Mendel was rediscovered. But we didn't really understand the nature of molecular genetics until much later. It wasn't until the 40s that the work of Avery and others showed that DNA is the hereditary material. And then the work of Watson and Crick in the early 1950s showed how DNA works, how its double-stranded nature makes it an ideal means of conveying hereditary information. After Watson and Crick in the late 50s and early 60s, a number of researchers showed how DNA is replicated sort of through semi-conservative replication and how the uh, codons of three base pairs, so 64 combinations of the four letters of DNA, can give about 20 amino acids as well. Stop the All right, so the first real empirical data in population genetics, besides strong Mendelian characters that are often, well, they're unusual in a number of ways. They're unlike quantitative traits in that they're usually determined by a single locus. And they're a little bit unusual in that often they have a strong selective effect. The first real data that is molecular genetics is that of allozymes and isozymes. These are protein variants that were developed uh, by Hubby, Dick Lewinton at Harvard, and others in the mid-60s. The idea is that you extract protein from a tissue. It could be human, it could be cow, it could be any animal, or any plant or fungi. You run it in a starch or an acetate gel, not that dissimilar to an agarose gel, where an electric current separates it. This separates it by size and charge. And then to stain it, you add the substrate for a particular protein. And wherever uh, that substrate is uh, changed so that you can visualize it, you know the protein is there. So this is what allozymes look like. This is phosphoglucose isomerase. It's a core Krebs cycle enzyme. We have it. This happens to be from a plant. Basically all plants, animals, and fungi and bacteria and uh, aerobic bacteria have phosphoglucose isomerase. Uh, and you can see that there are multiple copies. These are protein variants, and they differ by size and charge. We call allozymes and isozymes sometimes the same thing. The allozyme is technically different alleles at the same locus. That means there's one position in the genome where that protein is coded, but there are multiple alleles of different size. For a lot of these proteins, there are actually multiple copies in the genome. And then there are isozymes, so they're different loci, and they perform the same, roughly the same function. So this is something like the globin family, where they all bind oxygen, but they may differ in size, and they perform that core function somewhat differently. The second kind of marker that developed, the next form of empirical data in population genetics, are restriction enzymes. These are proteins that can cut DNA at a certain recognition sequence. It's usually four to eight base pairs, and they just cut this sequence. And this creates a unique fragmenting pattern that can distinguish individuals if they differ in where they have these four to eight base pair sequences. It wasn't until the late 70s that uh, Sir Dr. Fred Sanger and others developed a way to sequence DNA. By understanding how DNA is replicated, they noticed that if you add, if you take DNA, you add DNA polymerase and a short primer like an Okazaki fragment as well as nucleotides, you can replicate that DNA. And if you insert uh, something called a terminating nucleotide that is integrated into that growing DNA chain, but stops the, uh, it, it has a shape such that another nucleotide can't be added to the chain after that. If you do that, then you, you stop the reaction and you can radio label or fluorescently label that terminating nucleotide so you know what base pair it is when it ends. And what you end up with is this kind of laddered sequence. So nowadays we do Sanger sequencing uh, by using different fluorescent labels for the stop codon for A, T, G, and C. 
And if you run them in an acrylamide gel that can separate um, by a single the separate molecules by a single uh, nucleotide, you get this ladder. And each step in the ladder tells you what the base pair is, where the uh, sequencing reaction was terminated by these fluorescently labeled stop codons. This is a great technique, although uh, now we find it rather expensive. But it has a limitation. After about 700 base pairs, it's not possible to do to get more integration. Um, you, you simply get too much termination. So the, there's a limit. You can only sequence 700 base pairs at a time. And this is smaller than many genes, uh, let alone whole chromosomes. So you have to piece together uh, the sequence for full genes by sequencing them in parts. So until about 15 years ago, it was simply too time-consuming and expensive to do this for more than a handful of individuals. So you could never generate the kinds of popula population sizes, the, the size of data sets that you need to do population genetics. And even five years ago, this was really considered too expensive. Now, key to this um, is the polymerase chain reaction, and it does allow one to amplify DNA. And as we've gotten better at it at, at PCR, some of the cost of Sanger sequencing has come down. Uh, but we can use the PCR reaction without actually sequencing. So if we have a repetitive uh, region uh, called a short tandem repeat or a microsatellite, where there's a two to five base pair repeat, like an AC, 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 that's repeated a certain number of times. And what varies is not the, repeat, the sequence of the repeat, but the number of repeats that an individual has. So then if there's a flanking sequence and a couple hundred base pairs where individuals differ in whether they have 20, 22, or 25 repeats, then if you develop a primer to that flanking sequence, you can simply run in a gel based on size and tell how many repeats an individual has. And this has become one of the most popular kinds of markers, microsatellites or STRs. In humans, this is the primary system that the FBI and other government agencies use to tell people apart. It's been very powerful for that. In many plants and animals, these are widely used as well. These are easy to score in a gel or in a DNA sequencer, and they're codominant. So if an individual just has a band, say, at 20 repeats, it indicates that they have two copies of it. But if an individual is diploid, some plants will work with this semester or not, um, but if the individual is diploid, you're going to find both copies. And if an individual just has one band, it means they're a homozygote. However, characterizing this flanking sequence to use as the primer is somewhat difficult. So the, this type of marker is fairly difficult to develop. And often you only get 6 to 10 or 20 for an organism of interest. And that limits your ability to analyze the entire genome. You're just looking at a small subset of the of your organism's genome as a way of making inferences about the rest. And that, that simply is inaccurate. And if you develop them in one organism, such as a human, they don't work particularly well in a related organism like chimpanzees because mutations in that flanking site or other factors can cause null alleles. And th this is simply a bias that microsats have uh, when you, in, in the way that we develop them. Another technique that exists is called the amplified fragment link polymorphism. This is sort of a hybrid approach where you do a restriction digest, then you add an adapter of about 20 base pairs that you can use as a primer sequence. And this um, allows you to as assess variation in whether or not individuals have that restriction digest site or a difference in the base pair next to that digest site. And what this generates is uh, hundreds of dominant loci that differ among individuals. The drawback of these is that they're dominant. You know whether an individual has a band or not, but you don't know um, what, what the other allele is, uh, simply due to the way they work. They're, they're what we call a dominant marker. You don't know anything about homozygosity of these or heterozygosity of these. An individual is either zero or one, sort of binary. Uh, we call this DOM. So it ends up being a drawback of this kind of marker, as we can't do a lot of population genetics with it. Uh, furthermore, they don't give us a lot of location information on where these restriction sites are in the genome.
there are new methods that are rapidly changing how we do population genetics. And one of these is that there are new ways to sequence DNA. One of these is called pyrosequencing. This is one of a handful of techniques that we now call next generation DNA sequencing. And what biochemists realized is that when a new nucleotide is integrated by DNA polymerase into a growing DNA chain, uh, there's a ATP that's active. And if you attach a luciferase to this, you can use it to generate a little bit of light. And if you have a very fine sensor, you can have a single, mo a, a single luciferase uh, action uh, be detected. So you can uh, detect a single nucleotide uh, with this chemistry being integrated into a growing DNA chain. So if you use something that looks like a computer chip and spread um, using nanotechnology a sample of DNA across it, and then you add DNA polymerase and uh, different bases all the time, you can see whether a C, an A, a G, or a T is integrated into each of those growing DNA chains. So if you spread a couple hundred million uh, molecules of DNA across a sample, you can sequence them all at the same time by adding first A, then C, then G, then T, and doing it over and over again, and detecting which one has luciferase activity one at a time. And this is the basis of next generation sequencing. Um, what this is very useful for is detecting a kind of polymorphism called a single nucleotide polymorphism, where one individual has a C and a G, and the other has a T or an A at a particular spot. These tend to be ubiquitous across the genome. In humans, there's approximately one that set, distinguishes one person from another every hundred base pairs. So two of us walking down the street um, likely differ by about a million SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, among us, uh, each one being like this. Uh, so th these are common. And now that uh, next generation sequencing is becoming uh, cheap, we can generate these pretty quickly. One way that many of us uh, save money on this is instead of doing this across the whole genome, we digest the genome with uh, restriction enzymes. And then we take the ends, the, those sites that have been cut, and we just sequence those ends. This is an approach that allows us to sequence about 1 to 5% of the genome of many organisms uh, and just look at differences in those restriction sites. And this is a technique we call restriction site associated DNA sequencing, or RADSeq for short. This is a little bit more on how RADSeq looks. Uh, at some point this semester, we'll talk about it because my lab does a fair amount of it. Uh, it's uh, somewhat difficult, but once we get it working well, uh, we get a lot of data. We can generate about 10,000 markers compared to 20 for microsatellites uh, for an organism pretty quickly. Within a few years, uh, we may instead move to whole genome resequencing. This is a, an approach that is increasingly feasible. It's computationally challenging. You're going to have billions of sequences for each individual. And if you want to compare a sample, uh, say, several populations of an organism, you're looking at terabytes, if not petabytes, of data. Uh, and it's simply so computationally challenging that um, it, it, it's just hard to do. Um, but the cost at this point is actually not that exorbitant. Uh, it's the kind of thing that can be done for a couple hundred thousand dollars, which sounds like a lot and is a lot, um, but is not unrealistic. So I'd like to stop there, um, and welcome to the first week of class. Thank you.